talk about the lighthouse, and I'm going to tell you why you should see it. Before I set the stage for this review, this review is a little bit different because the lighthouse is a little different, uh, which is what makes it fantastic. Amazing, amazing film. I want to talk about it, and I want to encourage you to see it. Normally, I would have some notes and whatever, and I also wouldn't be on the highway driving. I don't really need notes, again, because it's a kind of different film, and you'll understand that in a few minutes. But also, I, I don't really have a section where I can just give you, like, okay, the first part, you know, of a review for me usually is, like, talking about it in generalities, trying to get people to watch it. Then I usually go into specifics and thus need to give you a spoiler alert. I don't think there's really anything that I could talk about here that's going to spoil the movie for you or the experience for you. There's not really any big, like, duh, like, moments that I can, you know, give you. Um, so it's going to be hard for me to judge when that point is, but I will give you, like, there'll be a point where I'll be going through a couple things and I'll say, okay, here's where I have some questions. I'll give you a spoiler alert. Um, but just letting you know there's some things off the bat that I might say that you might be like, well, I didn't know that going into it and you just told me. And it's like, yeah, but it's, it's not, it's something you would have learned within a few minutes. It definitely doesn't, in my opinion, spoil anything or, uh, ruin the enjoyment of, of thinking what's, what's to come here. So Robert Eggers directed, had a hand in writing, uh, The Witch, or as I like to call it, The Vivitch. Uh, I believe that was his first major debut film. Uh, and then we have The Lighthouse. Came out in 2019. Fantastic. It's in black and white, if you didn't know that. Again, these are things that I'm like, I don't really think it's a spoiler. And it stars Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. And that's it. So, um, we have these two amazing actors pitted against each other working off each other. We have a setting, which is a lighthouse. Again, that is it. We've got some very simple, in a way, ingredients to create a fantastic film. Um, not only with, I mean, ingredients being writer, director, um, these actors, the setting, and the fact that there is, there, there's no other setting, there's no other actors, there's a lot of, it's not a lot of overcomplicated whatever. It's not, um, I would say that's not a gimmick. It's, we get what we need and that's it. <clears throat> Came out in 2019 if I forgot to say that. I don't remember now. So, how do I give you a general summary to get you to watch this thing? It is unlike any other film that I've seen, uh, personally, including The Witch. It's going to get kind of difficult here to give you stuff without giving you spoilers. So it is not what I would, I, I do not classify it as a horror film. I think The Witch and The Lighthouse are both classified that way. And they both rely on lore. And there's definitely a creepy vibe. There's a very dark vibe in both. Um, I understand why it would be in the horror genre. And maybe that's why I love them so much because they're not stereotypical horrors. Um, I would say this one specifically is, or both of them are, are definitely have some psychological thriller element to them, but not, they don't fit into a box very neatly, especially the lighthouse. I, it's like I said, for me, just throwing, throwing it into the, the box of horror doesn't do it justice. Uh, I feel like it is genre breaking, but not specifically because it's got like, you can't put it into a box. It's this thing and it's this thing and it's this thing. It's that. It's just its own thing, it really is. And that's hard to tell you right now without giving you some specifics. So, um, it is creepy, it is dark, it has psychological elements, it plays with the audience and the viewer and toys with them, and it, uh, it definitely gives you room to question things as a lot of good horror movies do it is not a horror movie in the aspect that it is just there to scare you it is there to make you think as well so that is why it's hard for me to classify it's not about scaring you i don't think that's what it's about 
and to me a horror movie is about that to me that's what its primary objective is and a lot of them on the side have other things going on that that make them great or better horror movies in my opinion and those things are you know making you think about stuff questioning this questioning that um the relation to you on on a certain level um to me is what makes great great media in general that that someone can relate to it but it also challenges them and i feel like some horror movies just don't do that so again i would not classify this as a horror movie i don't really think there's many like jump scares or anything that will stick with you and haunt you i would say there's nothing supernatural but that's not quite true it's built off of lore and we are at sea so i don't i still would say it's not supernatural in nature or whatever um but we've got some lore here and there's some questions how can i continue to persuade you to watch this film um it challenged me as a viewer it, it here's the biggest thing here's the biggest sell for 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 you it was such an experience that I believe that if I were to watch it again and try to focus on some elements, I wouldn't be able to because like, because it would draw me in too much. It was very engaging. It did take me out of the present reality and set me in this new one and said, you're going on a ride, strap in, here you go. Um, it was just encompassing. There's so much about it, like I've mentioned, what I think a good movie, period, or book, or whatever, music, should do sometimes, the, or I shouldn't say just should, but the things that I like the most are things that I can relate to, that engage me, yet challenge me, and are not simply so so um fantastical and so disjointed and abstract that you can't latch on to anything like that doesn't do it for me <clears throat> this film puts you in a setting that you're probably not familiar with being in the world of a lighthouse in you know i wish that i figured out the time period ahead of this but we're talking hundreds of years ago and uh, a very different world than we live now yet there's enough there because we're talking about to me one of the things that I, I'm just I need to relate it back to Stephen King and not because it I mean Stephen King is just a, a phenomenal storyteller and it's not just about horror or scary things what he does best is to pick at relationships between humans and their relationships between them, them themselves and put that in a setting where they're challenged and they have to I mean obviously story can't exist without conflict for the most part um, and he just does this in a way that that gives such a richness to characters and the story and engages the reader or in this case the viewer in such a way that you come away with some questions about yourself and the world around you or your friendships or relationships or whatever so uh, this film despite it not being super relatable in its setting um it's very relatable on a human aspect but that's what's awesome is that it's set in a place where you are like man this is totally foreign to me i know what a lighthouse is i think i know what its function is but i don't know the day-to-day -day workings of it you get to see some of that um and just everything is just so the experience is just so it is edited phenomenally to keep you engaged keep you there and again the storytelling is what's very different it is incredibly different we have these two men in a lighthouse and we get to see some of those challenges without it just slapping you in the face and it doesn't hold your hand this movie does not hold your hand it gives you an experience and it's that's it um, and there are some symbols here that I didn't catch 
that I should have, which I'm going to talk about soon. But it, that's the thing. I didn't catch them just because I, I, I was so engrossed and, and I just, afterwards, looking some things up, I was like, why didn't I see that? And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But again, before I get into specifics and have to put a spoiler in here, I just want to entice you to watch this movie because it is so... It is done so well and it is done so differently and the editing, it doesn't jump around in time. But one of the things that it does when I talk about it plays with the audience and the viewer is that you don't know sometimes how much time is taking place here. You are in a setting and that is its own character. The lighthouse itself is a character. And when the setting in a uh, film or a book or any type of story, when the setting is a character, it, I mean, it should always be looked at as a character. That is good storytelling. And they made the lighthouse a character. The setting here is a character. It is done incredibly well. So if you want something that is dark, that is edited, and the story is told in a way that you aren't familiar with, that you probably haven't seen many times, that will challenge you, that will make you think a little bit, then I suggest you watch this film. Uh, it is just, that's what it'll do. It will totally engage you to where you wonder what's happening sometimes. You don't understand the purpose or the function at times. It seems linear, but there's things going on where you aren't 100% sure of the reality you're in. That's as much as I'm going to say before I add spoilers in here. So, watch the movie, come back, or you can keep watching or listening, and uh, I still encourage you to watch the movie afterwards, because I don't think this is going to ruin it for you. So, spoiler alert is here. Boom. Spoiler alert. Well, we continue. This is really the review and recap section of this. I hope I've enticed you enough to go see the movie uh, now I'm going to get into some specifics, and if you are watching this uh, and you haven't seen the movie, I hope that this continues to entice you to see the movie because it is fantastic. So, to set the stage once again, here we have two gentlemen that are um, similar in a lot of ways. They obviously have some differences too. So, we have uh, Robert Pattinson, who is playing Ephraim. Uh, younger gentleman. We have an older man uh, who is Thomas, played by Willem Dafoe. Now, similarities between the two. They're both doing this work at a lighthouse. They're both very hard-headed and stubborn and strong-willed. Don't like to be told what to do. And they both kind of have a shifty past that doesn't really get revealed to us, and they don't seem incredibly trustworthy uh, people. Um, and, like, they have some dark histories. Some differences are that one is in a position of power, which is Thomas, played by Willem Dafoe, and Ephraim is, is new to the work, and younger, and a subordinate, um, who needs to obey Thomas's commands, basically. It's like he's a commanding officer, in a way, or a captain, except not. Uh, Thomas, anyway. So, we are in a lighthouse. That's where we're at. We have this setting where there's not a lot of variances and differences. Um, let's get into it. So, where do we start? We have these two characters very early on. Uh, Thomas establishes himself as the one who needs to be obeyed. Ephraim is new to the work. He's read basically the handbook. And despite the fact that he seems to have a shady past, he wants to do this job to the letter by the book. Uh, so at supper time, Thomas is toasting, a sailor toast at supper. And Ephraim does not toast back. And Thomas says, that's bad luck. You can't leave me hanging on this toast. And Ephraim says, well, the handbook says we're not, not to be drinking. And Thomas is like, the handbook also says that I'm your boss, so you better do as I say. 
So they have a toast, everything's jolly, whatever. But that's established then that we've got two people that, again, are strong-willed, and one has to bend to the other's will to a degree uh, because he is the boss. And uh, if Ephraim wants to continue working, or if it was like basically the, the <laughs> equivalent of getting good reference, then he would need to obey. So that's what we have going on there from the start. Now, Thomas is a man of the old world. He is very superstitious. And, I mean, there's regular superstitious, and then there's superstitious in certain categories like this, where he's like sailor superstitious. Like, he's got some specific things that he is concerned about, like the toast thing. Um, early on, Ephraim is trying to... He's got, he's got his hands full, and he's trying to get into this doorway, and there's a seagull. And it's in his way, and it won't move, and it's just squawking at him, and he starts to throw some pebbles or something at it. Thomas sees this, comments on it later at supper, and says, hey, you don't be doing that. Ephraim says, yeah, tall tales. You know, um... Because Thomas says, that's bad luck. Like, you know why? It's because in the birds, he doesn't say this all at once, but he, he reveals, you know, that sailors' souls are in these seabirds. That's why you don't do that. You don't mess with them, because it's bad luck. Uh, Thomas, er, yeah, Thomas imparts this knowledge on Ephraim. Ephraim says tall tales. Thomas reacts violently, gives him a box on the air. So, that happens. There's some conflict between the two. We already know this. One of the other things is that Thomas and Ephraim are supposed to rotate their duties. Um, there's a lot of duties to be done around the lighthouse. Some of them are a little more chill than others. So, one of the duties is to man the lighthouse. Make sure that the light is working properly. Uh, the other thing is to do all the other chores <laughs> that endure, like shoveling coal... Um, you know, maybe preparing food, uh, cleaning up, painting, just kind of like all these really menial tasks, some of them incredibly laborious, and that is what Ephraim is basically told to do, other than the cooking. Thomas does the cooking. Um, Ephraim is told, though, you know, when he, he brings it up to Thomas, says, we're supposed to rotate, like, I'm supposed to do the light, the light one day, and then you the next, and we're supposed to rotate you know, in shifts. And Thomas shuts him down and says, nope, that's not what's happening. Uh, you're going to do these duties and I'm going to man the light and that's it. And that's how it goes. So we've got them at a conflict. Ephraim submits, but reluctantly, and he's not happy about it. Now, we've got these two characters alone for an indeterminate amount of time at this lighthouse. Um, they got certain needs. And... Ephraim gets incredibly sexually frustrated. One of the things that he finds in his mattress the very first day is a hole cut into it, and there's a mermaid sculpture in there. It's like this big, about the size of your hand. Or it can fit into your hand nicely. And we've mentioned, you know, like there's a lot of lore and superstition and some mythology in this film, and mermaids are a part of that for sailors, especially in this time. And... I wish I knew the, the, the time period to give you. I, I didn't think of looking that up. So Ephraim holds on to this mermaid. Non-coincidentally, he also sees a mermaid more than once. And this is where we start to wonder, is he dreaming? Is he seeing these things and then just not talking to Thomas about them? Keeping it to himself because he doesn't know if he saw it? Because... He wants his own little secret because it's scary. Like what? He sees dead bodies floating um, in, in the water. Like he's wading out there. Like there's a lot of stuff that happens. One of the great things that happens in this film is that we see these two characters and we are observing them and their actions and their relationship with each other and the lighthouse. But at some point, things take a turn, and we basically are Ephraim. And we are really seeing things through his eyes, and we are confused along with him, and we don't know what to believe along with him. Because of these things that he sees, we don't know sometimes if he's dreaming or not. We don't know what's real. 
Um, and at a certain point, Thomas says, that's not how it happened. What are you talking about? And, and says these things to Ephraim that confuse us all much more. We don't know what the reality is. Uh, I mentioned that the lighthouse is a character. What great films do is make the setting a character, a very important one. You could argue that the setting is always a character, even in bad films. But exceptional films will, you know, have, I believe, the setting as its own character. That's incredibly important. And this film does that. The lighthouse has characteristics um, and, and certain things that, that happen there. Uh, that, that make it this character. I'm going to compare it to another movie that I haven't done a review on yet, but I really should, because it's an amazing movie, and I'm going to wait till I see it again, although I've seen it enough times, I think three or four, probably just three, uh, that I, I can definitely talk about it without seeing it again. But um, I'm going to make some, some comparisons here. So... Um, one of the things is that there is um, this blaring siren noise that comes from the lighthouse. Now, the lighthouse is there for a couple reasons. One is to warn ships and to let them use it as a navigation tool and say, hey, you're getting close to this body of water, or this, this I mean, sorry, this, this body of, this, of land, and uh, if you need to stop here, whatever. But I didn't realize there'd be a blaring siren as well, and it's there. And it's very obvious, and it's very loud, and it is discombobulating and uncomfortable. Ephraim feels this as well. He's new to this whole scene. Um, he talks to Thomas one time at dinner and says, you know, um, that he's starting fresh. And this is kind of where Thomas is like, you got a shady past, bro. And Ephraim is like, hey, it's nothing wrong with a man wanting to start fresh. And he said that he was doing really hard labor in, up in Canada, uh, working with lumber and, and whatever, but he wanted, he heard that, you know, you could make a good living uh, minding these lighthouses, and the further away you go, the more money you make, and he wants to go build a house. Thomas basically calls him a walking cliche, and that's kind of that. But in that exchange, um, yeah, we learn that Thomas is new to this, or sorry, Ephraim is new to this. Thomas is a veteran. He's been doing this a while. Ephraim is new to this, and we know that just because he's not acclimated to the sounds of the lighthouse. Neither are we, for the most part. I mean, I don't know who you are, but um, uh, fair to say that you probably haven't lived in a lighthouse before. So, one thing that happens is that during the course of the movie, we either get acclimated to the sound of the lighthouse, or it just goes away, or the volume gets turned down, or it doesn't happen as often, or we just don't notice it. And that's obviously very purposeful, because... Ephraim's there for a longer period of time, and he gets used to it, so we do too. And that is one thing that I want to compare to the movie Drive, because there is this thing about this movie, both of these films, that is amazing, that they draw you in, they just... I was going to say pin you down. They, they keep you seated. They're on, you're on the edge of your seat, but you're seated. You are ready for the ride, or you're not ready, but you don't have a choice. Um, it's, it just draws you in so well that you live this experience with the film that it's kind of hard to analyze it. And I have seen some things in Drive. I don't want to go into too much detail because I'm going to talk about it in another review. But there's a piece of clothing that gets worn, and sometimes you wonder, why does it get worn then? What happens when it, when it does? Um, when it gets taken off, when it gets put on? Are, you know, does that change things? Um, and you think about this because it's incredibly significant in the movie. But then you try to analyze it on another watch... And it's really hard to stay focused on it because the movie just sucks you in. And I have a feeling that would be the same thing if I try to watch The Lighthouse again. You know, what is it like when that siren goes off? Does anything change? How often does it go off? What are the intervals like? Do they change throughout the film? Does the volume get turned down? Am I just used to it now? Um, those are things that, that you know, I, I think about. Um, so that, that's, that's a thing. Incredibly well done. Talked a little bit about... Ephraim's sense of reality, which is ours, getting distorted, confused, we don't know what's really going on sometimes. So that's happening. Now, it is told to us that Ephraim is going to be going home at some point here. And 
him and Thomas just get rip roaring drunk the night before, and they have a dance party, and it's all fantastic. Because celebrating, Ephraim's going to go back. Maybe they're going to get a supply drop off, I'm assuming. Two birds, one stone, right? Sh whatever ship is bringing Ephraim back to the mainland is also going to drop off some supplies. Maybe a new dude for Thomas. However, there's an event that happened earlier. And Ephraim met the seagull again. But it's a cyclops. Maybe it's a different seagull. Maybe something happened to the seagull to make it lose an eye. This time, you know, it was kind of just getting in his way too much and... He grabs it by the feet, and he just murders the thing unmercifully. He is just swinging it into the rocks, not letting go. I think after two times that bird was dead, it stopped making noise, and he went for about 20. Now, this is another relation to the movie Drive, because there are... Few instances of violence, but when they happen, they are strong. Very strong. That's what happens here. Complete overkill. We see he is completely irrational. Is he, you know, buying in to the myth and wants to kill the bird? Or is he showing that the, the bird doesn't, it's not real, it's not a real bad luck thing, whatever. But this happens, and the night before Ephraim leaves, they party. And then the next day, oh, the winds change overnight. Somehow the ship that's supposed to be there to pick him up doesn't come. Thomas lets him know, this is your fault for messing with the birds. And, you know, Ephraim doesn't want to believe it, and, and that's a source of contention. Thomas is, like I mentioned, a man of the old world. He has very many... Well, he has monologues. And during his monologues, he takes on a little bit of a different voice. He's very prophetic, uses a stronger diction, archaic language, um, and he's lighted in such a fashion, too, that he seems like a prophet. Now, this is where we're going to get into wrapping things up a bit. Because one of the things I didn't know, I wasn't thinking about until after the movie, when I did a little bit of research, and so... Silly that I didn't think of this, but uh, there is a, a stronger tie to Greek mythology besides the sirens. So if you're not familiar with the sirens, uh, they, they have been depicted as mermaids that are calling sailors or other people to them. They have beautiful, irresistible voices, and they usually themselves are incredibly beautiful, and they lure people in and then they drag them asunder down to Hades, or hell. So, that's there. Very obvious. Before we get into wrapping things up, I mentioned that Thomas said he was going to be the keeper of the light, and he was not going to let Ephraim go up there, and that's what happened. But Ephraim went up there a couple times, got close, and it's locked up, but he saw Thomas in there once, just naked, bathing in the light, moment of pure bliss and, and why wouldn't you want to experience this this amazing feeling um alcohol is a running theme throughout because they get loaded a lot and uh after the supplies doesn't show up they dig up according to thomas's direction a crate from the dirt full of alcohol. And when they go through that, they mix honey into turpentine. And they drink that. This is not a good thing for being mentally and emotionally healthy. Um, this is obviously going to play into your perception of reality and what's happening. These are not good things. So that's another thing that runs through this. We've got alcohol, loneliness, um, monotony, anxiety over when you're going to go home, conflict with the other person there. All these things could easily break a person. But on top of that, we've got this element of mythology and superstition and possibly supernatural. So... 
here's an abrupt ending for you. This is what happens. They get into another fight. Ephraim basically tries to bury Tom alive. Steals his keys, runs up to the light. He gets there. And in all its glory, he is bathing in the beauty of the light. But that light is not meant for him. And he is cast down. And he falls down the stairs. And at the very end, we see him on the beach with seagulls eating his intestines. This is the story of Prometheus and Proteus. Thomas representing Proteus and um, Ephraim being Prometheus. Now, Prometheus was supposed to steal fire from the gods to give to humans. That fire was representing knowledge. He wanted to share this. Good intentions. But he was not permitted to do that, and he did it anyway, and he was punished by being chained to a rock and having this bird of prey, I can't remember if it's an eagle or a falcon or a hawk or whatever, that comes and eats his intestines every day, for eternity, daily. That's what happens. And here we have Ephraim, for all intents and purposes, selfishly wanting to bathe in the light. And it's not meant for him, and he does it anyway, and he is cast down, and he suffers the fate of having these birds eat his intestines. I really love that connection. I don't think this is a retelling of that myth. But it does reference the myth, which is beautiful. I love it. It's fantastic. If this hasn't enticed you to see the film, I don't know what will. I've already told you if you want something a little edgy, different, dark, that, that challenges you, makes you wonder what the heck is going on, but is so engaging, I mean... They play with your perception as an audience member. You don't know what's happening because the characters don't necessarily know what's happening. Um, it is just a great experience. It, it is fantastic. And that is really all I have to say about it. I will see you on another time. Bye.